that we'd be collecting some of these fungi in our nurseries in the soil to sort of make sure they're present in the Um it, It's always wise, and I, I advise Wayne to do this, to collect a little bit of litter and stuff from the area and, and spread it around. It can't hurt, but you don't want to move from batch to batch. But really, if, you, if you're building on, if you're not just starting bare, if you're starting at an edge, you should be able to get them anyway. If you're starting near a little patch, you should be able to get them anywhere. The difficulty is where you're starting away from somewhere. And there's nothing else around. There, well, you've got to find your nearest patch and maybe collect a little bit of leaf litter from there. But talk to the fungi people. They'll, they'll let you know. You'll just hear. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I'm wondering, are you aware, and this is the sunshine case, that we've been trying to um, link some of those pristine pockets of rainforest, um, they now just tiny yeah. um, parts, and I'm just wondering, is there a group up there or groups that are well, trying to do that? Yeah, there are. The, the NHP funded the Rainforest Recovery Program, which led to the listing of the semi evergreen vine thickets as an endangered ecological community by the federal government. So groups such as Noosa Lanking would have been involved with that, groups further afield at Kinkin have been involved with that, groups in the Bernard Mary have been involved with that. I believe Sunshine Coast Regional Council has a program to look at that. Sunshine Coast Environment Group, if you want to go to a non-government organisation up there, would be able to put you into links. Plus there's a Mullaney Bush Links project if you're up on the mountain there in the Blackwall Range. No, it's been simply that yeah. last time I was up there, um, I saw some uh, just exquisite rainforest absolutely raised mm. um, mm. for a um, car park. <coughs> <coughs> yes. Well, on a good news front, that's still happening, and we're still going backwards in terms of our native landscape. But on the good news front, since the 1980s, we've been able to reduce vegetation clearing by 75% in this region. And when it ended, when under the last... State government, when clearing went up around Queensland, in South East Queensland, it stayed flat. So the partnerships and linkages we've made between the community and government policies and VCAs and local laws and conservation zoning and incentive programs and VCAs and stuff has held the line in South East Queensland when it hasn't in other areas. We're still going backwards. But we've got it down to a level where it's on the, on the ropes, as it were, with a final push, we can probably sell it. Do that question. What's that? Oh, I was actually going to just say that was the fungi thing. Yeah. Just like, um, what's the, you know, when we vegetate, normally it's the trees that get put in the ground. Yeah. But no one really thinks about the mycorrhizal association underground and how that, yeah. you know, how the fungi, as you said, lead the way for everything else mm. and how the, like, you know, the um, pioneers of yeah. people plants. Is that something that one day Australia is going to start looking at, like, other countries? Oh, I, I think part of the reason we plant near edges is to get those effects, even though we don't know them all. And I don't think anyone's ever funded a comprehensive fungi survey yet, let alone a comprehensive biodiversity survey or a beetle survey or an anything survey. Um, we sort of go, well, you know, if we do that and we connect near the edge, we'll get all these free ecosystem services like that. I know in people who've done dune rehabilitation, they're very particular about making sure that they've got some soil samples in it because in the June situation it's the mycorrhizal fungi that make the moisture availability in the sandy ecosystems and that's facilitated by the casuarinas. So it's an undiscovered country. Uh, we'd love to know more and I'd love to have 100,000 bucks and go to the fungi and say, there you go, off you go. Hey, let's propagate some mycorrhizal fungi, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it, and then take it. Has the main road got a clue like, to extrapolate on the plan out the offspot of the bridging no. areas? I'd like to say yes. <laughs> uh, but they've made a lot of roadside wetlands, so they understood that. But as you know, main roads was re-engineered under the last government and they got rid of all the environmental people. And what happens is for each main road project, they put together a consortium of contractors and staff. Now, each project is separate from every other project. So unless staff go between one project and another. So in, in 2000, we had high hopes that it was spread across all main roads and this would be the way things are done. No. So we've got to rely on local groups to engage with main roads as they're building projects to really force them into best practice. 
because it's not going to happen organically through a silo, dare we say, concretised engineering landscape like main roads, unfortunately. Uh, Ted, and then um, I'll cut to your name next year. Uh, Mick, uh, could you just indicate with the loss of uh, some of our standard legislation, the advance, scientific advances that you've seen probably in the last five years on ecosystem services, groundwater dependent ecosystems and, and climate change? So I understand the last part of the question, Ted, but the first part, you want to say what's been lost out of all that? Oh, well, we know what happened in 2012 to 2015. Yeah. We lost a whole lot of environmental staff across um, three levels of government. Well, OK, basically we've lost a lot of corporate memory. We've lost a lot of momentum on those issues. We were starting to drag government policy into looking at processes, not things, which you've alluded to, the groundwater and the ecosystem services and things like that. There's still a lot of community support for that, but governments can only undo damage at a tenth the rate we're done. And there's got to be will. And right now you have to say governments are not really enthusiastic on this topic. They're not out there being proactive on this topic. So if you have a local state member, local member or federal member, it's your job to go and see them and make sure these issues are in front of them. Because unless people are in their faces, they will forget about it. No politician ever got sacked really for doing nothing. Plenty have been sacked for being courageous. But they only respond if they see an issue in front of them. Otherwise, their default setting is to do nothing. The person needs to take... What was your name? Yeah, hi. Um, directly, and I'm from Soane. Yeah. Um, talking about the biological hotspot of South East Queensland, do you know I've identified Brisbane Forest Park as a really important corridor from Brisbane up to Mount Glorious, up to the Daniel Range? Are you aware that both the Inaugurate Reservoir and Mount Kutha is being fragmented they're creating leases, they're privatising, and they're putting in commercial tourist attractions. And I don't think they've looked at heritage, and I don't think they've looked at ecology. Mm. Yeah, it, it's always the death of a thousand cuts, isn't it? And that, that's what, when we did a fragmentation analysis, what we found is they're not big fragments being chopped in half, although that happens. It's little fragments being peeled away from the edge or keyholes being created. So when we looked at the patterns of fragmentation, that was the patterns we saw. And again, the antidote is to make sure as many people, every letter to a politician is worth 100 votes. So the more letters you get to people, the more they'll have to pay attention. But the policies that allowed us to, to look at those corridors, which is the biodiversity planning assessments and things like that, we lost tools. And the government hasn't seen it as a priority to put them back. I think most people were in shock after that onslaught and, and really we haven't got ourselves together to really push those. But they, there's too much to do, but we need to do it. So those corridors are important. They are redoing the biodiversity planning assessment. That corridor has come up as of regional significance, again. So that tool exists, so quote it and use it. The biodiversity planning assessment is currently under review by the Environment and Heritage Department and it will come up as bioregionally significant, that corridor. I have been stalking my ministers. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yes. It's a follow-up from, from this topic. Yeah. Um, I haven't kept up with it in recent years, but one of the big difficulties has always been the, the degree or the, the thoroughness of um, uh, cost-benefit or the, the, the loss. Yeah. What is the cost of of uh, removing all these functions. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not convinced that I've seen any really, or heard of any really good uh, pushes to try and work at the, at, around this so that, that we start looking at this whole issue of time mm -hmm. and the way they, they calculate things. If you're going to put a bridge across the river, if you're going to do something like that else, what are the costs? What will it cost to actually stabilise having put something else in there if you want to retain it? If you don't, what have we lost? And what does it actually cost mm. to, to put something like that back in place? Mm. I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of areas there that I think we, uh, we, we simply mute. Well, it's always a complex subject, but what you're broadly talking about is the value of ecosystem services and the way cost stands are 
Robert Costanza in the US did this in about 1997, and we managed to get it into the SEQ regional plan last time around, that the region had to take into account the value of ecosystem services and the cost of replacement of those services if it's surrounded for infrastructure. Now, he worked on a cost of replacement value, and he worked out the global value of ecosystem services with the order of a trillion dollars per annum. In South East Queensland, we did it recently, we worked out it's $13,000 per person per year is the value of ecosystem services we get. And if you start to subtract that, well, then it loses. But who, who, the problem economically is what's valued to one person is valued to others. So in Brisbane, we can say the cost of clearing and, and non-creep repair is the, what it costs to have to clean the drains out to rebuild all that hard infrastructure. Cost of fisheries is another thing. So we did a good run at it by getting in <coughs> ecosystem services, as Ted brought out, to the regional plan. It was a regional policy that all councils had to have regard to. But how many of them translated it to their plans? <coughs> how, so, how many case studies have been done and then pushed through to say, this is the sort of uh, process we should have done with these sorts of elements? I mean, the whole time frame, yeah. I'll do it over a 10 year time frame. Yeah. Well, we know that it's going to take a long time to get Well, we did a case study for the entire region. We published about it in Ecology and Society. The US Geological Society called, Service called it the seminal study the rest of the world should look at in South East Queensland. We did a case study with the uh, Morton Bay Regional Council where they mapped all the ecosystem functions and services in the area. The problem comes with a little concept of fungibility and trying to put a dollar value on all that. We can qualify and say this amount of ecosystem services has been lost, but the value depends on who's receiving those services. And people will say they have a willingness to pay, but will they pay? And so politicians are loath to, to base that on. But you can look at the engineering. We can say at the Oxbow that the way we implemented by protecting the ecosystem services made the road finish under budget and under time. So can we have more case studies? Can we get this thinking more into them? Yes, we can. It's in there in the regional plan now. They're reviewing the regional plan now. To keep it in there is a vital thing. So... You look at the documents for that, you can have your say on it and say, we need to look at this thinking. We need to look at how ecosystem services are being replaced when we lose its infrastructure. It's a complicated issue. I could go on for hours about it. Sorry, Bruce. Last question? Yeah, just a quick one. I was, I was just interested in, in these linkages and what we've just been talking about. In how, If you've done a lot of studies and there's a lot of information out there, has that been linked to the legal framework in any way to give it protection? Well, that's in it? the regional plan, yeah. which is under the Integrated Planning Act or the Sustainable Planning Act now. Yeah. It is formally constituted as a regional planning committee, which means it's a regional dimension under the State Planning Act. Okay. So that policy in the plan is law. Right. But like all laws, do they get implemented? They get interpreted. So council then has to interpret its planning scheme and say, how do we look after ecological systems or ecosystem services in our planning scheme? Mm -hmm. And who, who checks at that? So what we found is you can put it in, like in the Vegetation Management Act, I said on the Ministerial Advisory Committee, we put in the ecological processes on which life depends mm -hmm. as an object of the Act. Mm -hmm. But how it worked out is they would just map vegetation based on their photo interpretation and the high conservation values which encompassed all the processes, mm. never got implemented. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, put it in. No, oh, no, they're not doing it. You know, we haven't got it again. Continuous. There are a trillion reasons why they're not going to do it. And all us as to why they are. Mm. The development industry doesn't like constraints. Mm. Infrastructure providers don't like constraints. But I think you've proved that... Yeah. Uh, given those constraints, yeah. people will react to survive. Yeah. Therefore, you can build a highway across yeah. Yeah. A, a waterway. Um, so that only happened as a result of public yeah. pressure. There was no yeah. policy when we did the Oxbow. There was no VJ, <coughs> there was no offsets legislation, there was no climate change legislation. Yeah. Goodwill got us there yeah. when legislation didn't. Yeah. You've got to do it all. Mm. But it's, it's never easy. If it was easy, someone would have done it by now. Yeah. Believe me, we've tried. <laughs> Thank you. No Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. Mick, here you